um, you, you in fact are then relying on the, the professional standards of the lawyer involved to make sure that the various steps and pieces of the, the uh, transaction are put in place in order to allow the lawyer to render that opinion. Okay. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd like to move on to the panel discussion. I, I don't, are these microphones on? Can you turn these mics on? Okay. Perhaps we could start by um, just asking John and Jack a couple of questions related to what we've been talking about so far. Um, I made the point that a lawyer may very well want to give an opinion rather than, than uh, uh, trying to dodge the opinion. Most of what I have said has been about the relation of a lawyer to the lawyer's own client in, in rendering an opinion and a report and clarifying instructions, that sort of thing. John, I wonder if you could comment on whether you think that there's a difference in that respect between uh, the situation of giving a, an opinion to your own client and giving an opinion to a third party? I think the uh, general view is that there is a difference. Uh, I personally don't share that view. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think the function of a lawyer is to give the best advice he can, and if he can give an opinion to his client, he should be quite prepared to give the same opinion to a third party question as to whether the ambit of your liability changes depending on whether it's your own client or a third party. I think that's going to be dealt with later on this afternoon. What do you think of that? I think the theory is great. 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 The um, I think you have to look at it somewhat differently than a, an opinion to your own client. And so I, I think, I, think I, I, uh, I, try to, I try to be as careful with both of them, but I get a little more nervous with the, uh, with the financing opinion that's going right out. The, there's a tendency, I think, amongst law firms to ask for opinions that they're not prepared to give when the other side's asking. And we even have some of those in Toronto. Um, I think I think that's a that's 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 the real danger uh, in in these areas. That if if you if you're really asking for something that you're not prepared to give, firstly, um, I think it's unprofessional. But secondly, it's not doing you much good anyway, because uh, you pass that opinion on to your own client, and he can't uh, you can't hide behind it. He may be able to, but uh, I think you've just incurred a little liability to him directly. So, you know, I, I think I think the interaction between the opinions of the two sides. And, uh, and the fact of the, sort of the broadcast nature of the opinion do make, do make a difference. To, to what extent do you think you should be trying to guide your client um, as to what opinion the client should be uh, looking for? I, I had an example recently where um, I heard a lawyer say, in, in drafting a, a full-blown financing opinion that went on for five or six pages, there was one aspect of the transaction um, that I would have expected to be covered in an opinion, and I mentioned that, and the lawyer said, oh, well, the client didn't ask for that, so I didn't put it in. Um, the client, I think, clearly did not ask that because the client didn't know enough to ask it. I think that question could even be expanded a bit, Peter, because uh, I've had a, a case where a client having asked for an opinion, and, and it had to do with the indemnity provisions under an underwriting agreement, and the answer is not clear. And one law firm, I understand, put in a little clause saying that to the extent lawful, so-and-so will indemnify so-and-so. And then they gave the opinion that that indemnity provision was valid and enforceable. Well, what they're saying is if it's enforceable, it's enforceable. But if it's not valid, it's not enforceable. And I think that was one case where perhaps the client should have been shown that the opinion that on its face looked to be a pretty enforceable opinion really was no opinion at all. I think otherwise, 
you're probably not doing your duty to them. It was certainly my reaction in that case that, that in drafting the opinion, the lawyer should have, have sat down and rather than say, now, what and only what has my client asked me for, uh, should rather sit down and, and decide what is the appropriate opinion to be given in this case and try to give an opinion that, that is uh, full-bodied, as it were, covering the, the whole transaction. Yeah, if the client could draft the opinion for you, you we wouldn't need you. <laughs> sure. So needs your signature. Um, this morning, be before the session started, we were talking a little bit about the function of opinions. And uh, John raised uh, what might be called the negotiating function of an opinion. Maybe, John, you could expand on that a bit. Well, um, depending on the circumstances, it might be that your client is best served not by having an opinion on a certain point if he's going into negotiations on a particular transaction. Uh, one that came to mind is where we were representing a, a client who had a fiduciary obligation. And his problem was that if he received an opinion from us on the point, then he would have been required to take action, which could have brought, uh, well, could have ended up in litigation, or what have you. Rather than put him in the position where he had to act, we provided him with a draft opinion, which said that if an opinion was sought and asked, this would be the sort of opinion we would give, but we thought that the better action would be to go and speak to the other side and see if they could negotiate a change in the facts. And if the change in the facts then took place, then they'd get the other opinion, which was that everything was okay. So I think uh, opinions to that extent are useful to your client in negotiating. Uh, there's also people who will take an unequivocal opinion from their lawyer, throw it down the table and say, well, there's nothing else to discuss, obviously I'm right. What happens then is the other side gets their lawyer's opinion, which is usually diametrically opposed, and puts it down. And so what you've done is, uh, well, the lawyer's made some money, but the clients are no further advanced. I was on the other side of that matter, and we uh, regarded John's draft opinion as a nasty negotiating trick, and so we put our own opinion on the table. <laughs> and the facts changed. Um, one of the things I suggested was, was that perhaps a lawyer has an interest in giving an opinion rather than not giving an opinion. Uh, Jack, do you think a lawyer should insist on giving an opinion? No, I don't, because I think it's, you've really a, got to look to what's in the best interest of your client in the particular circumstances. A client approaches you on, say, a combines matter, and uh, your opinion might well be that the action that he's proposing to take is very risky. I don't think it's necessarily in his best interest to have that opinion in his file because uh, privilege is not always absolute. And it's the sort of thing that uh, if, uh, if the, uh, the boys, when they come in to raid and seize, find, will not necessarily help your client. Under those circumstances, it seems to me, uh, you should suggest to your client that, that he's better not to have an opinion from you. On the other hand, you've also got to protect your position. You should probably have a memorandum in your own file pointing out that you have discussed the matter with the client and, uh, and uh, that, that it was decided not to formalize it in an opinion, but this was the, 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 uh, the type of advice you gave him. Uh, I think under those circumstances, you have protected your position as you would in the giving of the opinion position, at least to a considerable extent, although there might be an argument later from your client as to whether, in fact, you told him what you had memorialized. Uh, and yet you haven't exposed him to the danger of having that opinion in his file. So I think there are circumstances. There are other circumstances, I think, where, where giving the opinion would involve too much complexity. I, I think our firm does not, by and large, give opinions in uh, the acquisition of a, uh, of, of a major public company because you'd need the opinion in 12 volumes and you still wouldn't spell out all of the things you've done. Again, it seems to me under those circumstances, you probably are protecting yourself and the client by having memos of all your discussions and very frequently writing to your client uh, as you go along telling your clients what you are doing and what you are not doing uh, with his agreement. 
So I think you can, you can probably have the best of both worlds in that kind of situation without formalizing it in an opinion. I would add, though, that the critical thing is that you have communicated with your client. Yes. <laughs> because too often the client, when you ask their opinion, uh, has in mind a course of action and only half listens to what you say. And if you run the risk when you haven't communicated with your client that later he will say, but you told me I could do this. Mm -hmm. And without some very clear communication between you and the client, uh, you may discover later that you had an opinion you didn't have, at least from the client's point of view. What about the client, John? Should the client be asking for an opinion? In which circumstance? In all circumstances. No, no. Um, I think business people tend to have a fetish for neatness, and they think that a transaction isn't really complete until they have the opinion. Uh, I'm not sure that the opinion advances things for them. Uh, potentially, in certain pretty arcane circumstances, it could be embarrassing. Uh, the opinion doesn't really, I, I think what the client should be doing is looking to see what purpose the opinion will serve. Uh, for example, I think someone mentioned a, an opinion on a house purchase. Well, that opinion serves uh, for two things. Uh, first of all, it's a good basis to go after the solicitor if, if the opinion is incorrect. But it also is a basis on which that person can then transfer title and feel assured that he's going to be able to do so. Uh, so there you have a, a felt need for an opinion. Uh, in the purchase of shares of a public company, say on a takeover bid, I don't remember ever having given an opinion on, on, in that circumstance because it doesn't serve any good purpose. It just adds to the costs, which are high enough anyway. Jack, what about the, the blessing aspect of a transaction that I referred to? Do you think being silent is in fact uh, expressing an opinion? Yes, I think, I think it is, and that's why I've suggested that you, you should have regular, and I agree, written better than oral communications with your client as you go along to point out to the client what you are and aren't doing. For two reasons for that. It's not only to, to, uh, for, as an insurance policy for yourself, but I think one of the very frequently justified complaints clients have about, against most, about most of us is that they're left hanging out there, having to assume that we're doing what we should be doing, uh, and it would be very comforting for them to know from time to time what we are doing. So once again, I think the communication to the client serves to two purposes, defining what you're doing, and so cutting down your liability, making sure that you're doing three purposes, making sure you're doing what he wants, and letting him know what you're doing. Well, that sort of covers the material we have. Um, we have five or ten minutes before coffee is served. Are there any questions that have come out of that? Sort of general introductory stuff, I guess. I have a couple questions. One to Mr. Lee. Uh, what dimension has word processing brought to the organization of legal opinions, if any? Well, I think that's, it's freed the lawyer to have the luxury of revision in uh, at the last moment. Uh, too often, I think, we tend to look at a document and say, well, I could do better, but it's got to get out in the next five minutes, so I'll let it go. The beauty of word processing, it seems to me, is that you can still make uh, important corrections uh, rather late in the game. And whether we like it or not, most of us tend to be operating in a structure where it's late in the game. So the word processing frees uh, that kind. I think ultimately it's going to go beyond that and the individual lawyer is going to have uh, some sort of word processing capability in his or her office. So it's going to be, your, your, your editing's not going to be on paper, it's going to be on a screen. It's an interesting point. The, um, 
clearly i think the distinction between a report and opinion gets very fuzzy at some some stage that's why i suggest that you really should be sitting down with the client before the transaction is completed to describe the kind of report or the kind of opinion that's to be given to ensure that that what you are doing is what the client wants you to do now in the real estate transaction situation um the reporting that you have checked various accounts and whatnot and i guess the ones you really report on are the ones that the purchaser could end up being liable for even though they weren't incurred by the purchaser um, it seems to me if you're silent on that and the purchaser then discovers that uh, there's an outstanding tax account for five hundred dollars you're going to have a very unhappy cl uh, client on your hands so you, you want your report to cover that although it's not that I would say is a report rather than an opinion, uh, but you, you really are setting out uh, the the uh, uh, some of the steps you have done, some of the things that you have, have checked on their behalf. Um, that is different, I think, than than the walk through the library kind of thing. Uh, those are are uh, uh, the the real estate report sets out uh, the things that you have taken responsibility for. Whereas the walk through the library is the background uh, to forming a, an opinion on a point of law. And there I quite agree with Dick. The, the client doesn't want to walk through the library with you. The client wants you to do that on your own and then give them a conclusion. I just specify once again, it depends on who the client is. Uh, when I've retained a lawyer in New York to give me a legal opinion, I probably do want to work, walk through the library with it. I'm not satisfied with a with a one paragraph opinion, uh, uh, but it, it, it depends on the purpose of the opinion, I think. Even, even there though, I don't think you want literally to see his route through no. the library. You want some organized backup for his opinion. Quite right. And in, in a, so that you can justify it. And I would agree, there are often times when you want to, to explain fully in your discussion how you reached an opinion. But I, I would again suggest it's not a, a diary of your research. I think what's happening, though, the opinions are getting longer, and I think it's a reflection of the fact that the lawyers are starting to feel the, the hot breath of their clients on their back because clients seem to have uh, gotten a taste for suing their lawyers. In the old days, there was one opinion that was issued by our firm some years ago in connection with a litigious matter, and after making reference to the matter under litigation, the opinion was, you will win. Now, <laughs> Yes, I asked the question. Yes, he did, but I don't think uh, <laughs> I don't think nowadays anybody in our firm would give that. Well, if they do, they'd only do it once. <laughs> but. John mentioned earlier something that that I've certainly noticed in opinions, and and that is the what might be described as the false opinion, um, where and, and it's particularly true in in large formal opinions where. There may be three pages of introduction and then two pages of numbered paragraphs, which are very formally worded uh, opinion paragraphs. Uh, from time to time, you'll pick one of those up and you'll find paragraph five says, uh, you know, the, the cat is black. Uh, and then when you look back in the third paragraph on page two, you'll find one of the assumptions is that all cats are black. And, uh, you know, that to me is a, a non-opinion. and. Uh, it, it seems senseless to be, not only is it misleading, it seems to be, to me, to be a senseless exercise to go through it's that. It's often the fault of the person who's asking for that opinion. Very frequently you're going to be asked by the other law firm to give an opinion which they know you can't give unless you make the silly assumption, but they still insist that you, you do it. And that is sometimes your only way out. I think, once again, though, when you're doing that to your own client, uh, that's dirty pool. If, 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 you have, if, if you have to do it because the other side's forcing you to do it and he knows what you're doing, well, that's, uh, he's being silly, I think, not you. Is there any other questions? The difficulty often is, is, as you know, that if you don't sort of sign the opinion on the dotted line, the, the transaction may fall apart. But um, you know, I, I guess that's an ethical question that this 
has to be dealt with. You, you have to decide to what extent you can, in fact, give that opinion. And as I mentioned, the, the sign on the dotted line syndrome is, is often the bank's own method of, of doing its internal auditing. Uh, by your standing up and saying, well, I simply can't give opinion number, paragraph number three, uh, it, it sets off a chain reaction, or it should set off a chain reaction in the bank where the thing goes up to a level where they can decide whether this is a transaction that they, they uh, want or whether, from their point of view, it should fall apart. Now, if you're acting for the borrower, uh, that can put you in a very difficult position with your own client. So there's no simple answer to that. Okay, why don't we uh, break for coffee and the next panel will start in about 20 minutes. Our second session this morning is on the, uh, what we've called in the material, the legal context uh, of the giving of legal opinions. We have two speakers. The first speaker will be David Stockwood, QC. David. Uh, he is a lawyer in practice in Toronto. Uh, he practices uh, civil litigation. Uh, he also uh, is a uh, law teacher uh, and has been teaching at the University of Toronto Law School. Following David Stockwood, our speaker will be David Bristow. Uh, David Bristow is also in practice here in Toronto. He is uh, the co-author of a text on mechanics liens and is a contributing author to other legal texts as well. He has uh, lectured in a variety of legal programs, including the law school at Osgoode Hall and the continuing legal education series of the Law Society. Uh, following uh, their uh, talks, uh, there will be a period uh, for questions. David Stockwood. Well, this uh, part of your program will probably seem exceedingly negative to you. We could call it the Fram oil filter lecture. You can pay us now or you can pay us later. And if David and I seem a little pessimistic, it's because uh, we're the guys who follow the elephant in the circus and uh, we're the ones that see the opinions which go wrong. Now, one of the problems with lecturing about uh, liability for opinion is that opinion is rather an ambiguous word. I'm sure you've all heard the old chestnut of the patient who goes to the doctor and after half an hour's consultation, the doctor says to the patient, I'm afraid, sir, that you're mad, stark raving mad. The patient says, doctor, I want a second opinion. The doctor says, you want a second opinion? You're ugly, too. <laughs> Using, in the context of this lecture, given the ambiguity of the word, I'm going to treat opinion as though it means any advice given throughout the spectrum of your legal activities, not just a formal opinion on a point of law. The background of liability is, or was, fairly straightforward. The, of course, your client can sue you. One of the danger areas when your client sues you is that he can sue you really for two things. The first thing he can sue you for is breach of a specific term of your retainer. And in my paper, I use the case of the lawyer who closed the deal by taking an undertaking from the other side to discharge a mortgage, and the mortgage wasn't discharged. And he was sued, and his defense was, I followed usual practice. And the judge said, that has nothing to do with it. The judge said that your specific retainer, your contract, was to close the deal in accordance with the offer of purchase and sale, and you were not contractually allowed to take the undertaking. The second and more general area is, of course, the implied warranty that you're going to exercise 
the standard of care of a reasonably competent and diligent solicitor. And that's usually what you get sued for. Now, for many, many years, you only had to worry about your client. But times are changing, and even though we lawyers have always made the ground rules over the ages, uh, we're also uh, becoming caught up in a wider scheme of liability for professionals. And I think there are three cases uh, which are probably of some significance in this field. The first, of course, is Headley Byrne. And the Headley Byrne case has been applied by Lord Denning to solicitors. It's been applied by a county court judge in Ontario. And the whole key to that case is the question of reliance. So that when you're doing an opinion, or you're giving someone advice, you now have to ask yourself not only who is my client, but who might be relying on me. The Supreme Court of Canada in Hagen Bamford, which was a case involving accountants, considered this question of reliance. And Mr. Justice Dixon considered three categories. One was foreseeability. Should you have foreseen that the plaintiff would rely on you? The second possible test was, did you know of a specific class of people who would rely on you, even though you didn't know the individual? And the third was, did you know the individual? In that case, the accountants had prepared statements for a company which was in some difficulty, who were looking for a new investor. And they said, first of all, that the statements had been audited, and secondly, that the company was in good shape. As a matter of fact, the company was in very bad shape. And Mr. Haig, who invested in it, sued the accountants. The accountants' defense counsel raised a nice lawyer-like defense. Gee, they didn't know who Mr. Haig was. And Mr. Justice Dixon in the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, that's far too narrow. They knew when they gave the opinion that there was a class of people, i.e. potential investors, who were going to rely on it. He didn't have to deal with the foreseeability. And that's the case which is coming, where you can honestly say, I did not know there was a specific class of people who would rely on my opinion. But the courts are going to say to you, you may not have known, but you should have known, you should have foreseen. Now, the third case is a decision of Vice Chancellor McGarry in England, Roth and Connors. And in that case, you had the classic situation, which if you explain it to a layman at a cocktail party, it proves to him that what he's always believed about lawyers was right all along. In that case, the solicitors had prepared a will and sent it to the testator for execution, and they had not said to him, when you get it witnessed, don't have it witnessed by a beneficiary or a spouse of a beneficiary. And the will was witnessed by the spouse of a beneficiary, testator died, and the beneficiary didn't take. The beneficiary sued. Now, the traditional thing was no privity of contract. I'm sorry, beneficiary, too bad. And Mr. Justice McGarry had to deal with two arguments. The first argument he dealt with was whether this question of whether a client can sue a lawyer in tort or contract. Because defense counsel in that case said, look, it's only in contract. Ergo, if a client can't sue a lawyer in tort, no one else can. It would be ridiculous that a third party uh, would be in a better position than a client. Well, Mr. Justice McGarry disposed of that somewhat specious argument by saying that in England, there's a dual standard, both contract and negligence. And he didn't have to go on to deal with the fact that it doesn't follow anyway. But what he said was, clearly in that case, there was no reliance by the beneficiary on the lawyer, but that it was simply Donahue and Stevenson. The beneficiary was someone to whom the lawyer owned, owed a duty of care because he was someone who he knew would be injured by his mistake. Uh, to my knowledge, that case has been considered only once in Ontario, and that was by Mr. Justice John Holland, who dealt uh, simply with this question of tort and contract. Uh, but it would be interesting to see uh, whether our courts are going to follow uh, that line. Seems to me a perfectly sensible one. It's, as I say, 
I've always found it difficult to explain to laymen why if a lawyer makes a mistake and the testator's dead, the beneficiary can't sue. Now, what is the standard that you're dealing with? Your standard is very easy to state, but hard to apply. It's the standard of a reasonably competent and diligent solicitor. And the usual thing which arises in these cases, whether you're being sued by your client in contract or by a third party in negligence, is whether you followed general and approved practice. Now, very easy to state the general position, but it's very difficult to apply it. There aren't too many cases in this field. Most of them seem to deal with house deals and the question of whether you're after, if you're retained, uh, whether you have to uh, be concerned with zoning, whether you have to be concerned with an occupancy permit. And they can go different ways. In one case, the judge says a lawyer has a duty to concern himself with zoning. In another case, in a, a great show of uh, fellowship and comradely concern, lawyers in Ottawa were called uh, to testify that the practice in Ottawa was that if you were retained after the offer was signed that you didn't have to worry about zoning. On that basis, the judge found the general and approved practice was not to concern yourself with zoning and the client did not recover. The best I think that we can do is to deal with some of the danger areas. And the first thing that you see if you act for lawyers who uh, are being sued by clients is you, you almost invariably see that the lawyer didn't ask himself this fundamental threshold question. What am I doing? What function am I doing? And does my client know what I'm doing? Have we got the same expectations? So that in this situation, I think your first question should be, what is my function? And that breaks down into a number of questions. What have I been retained to do? Who has retained me? Because the courts can frequently find a solicitor-client relationship when there's no formal retainer, when there's no money paid to the lawyer, when the advice is given in very informal circumstances. I think the next question you ask yourself is, should I be doing what I propose to do? And there are some obvious situations. The first is conflict of interest. Am I being asked to give advice or an opinion in a situation in which I'm in a potential conflict of interest? Now this comes up particularly when you're acting for both parties to a transaction. There's a case in the paper where uh, a man with his common law spouse came to the lawyer. The lawyers clearly thought that the man was their client and they arranged for a mortgage on a house without having the man do a declaration of trust in favor of the common law spouse. And the common law, uh, the man who they thought was their client subsequently disappeared. And the court said they were in a conflict of interest situation or potential one. They either should have advised her because she was their client or they should have made sure that she got independent legal advice. So that's one threshold question. Another threshold question is foreign law. The situation here is a little different in the States. In the States, it's a little more complicated where you're expected to know federal law and you're probably expected to know the law of Delaware if you uh, incorporate companies. In this, in our particular jurisdiction, the question you have to ask yourself is if there is some decision to be made as to what law applies, you've got to say, look, I am not qualified to give you an opinion on, let's say, take the obvious example, Quebec law, we're going to have to get Quebec counsel. Another and much more fuzzy area is the area of specialization or expertise. Something, I, the, an example which would spring to mind of an area in which I think you're probably negligent to do an opinion unless you have some special knowledge is that of patent law. But there are many other areas. And the problem with law is that we are not as yet formally specialized. The surgeon who undertakes an open heart uh, operation knows that he is being held to the standard of care of the surgeon. The specialists like David Bristol and Mechanics Lane, it's not clear whether he is held to a higher standard 
than someone who does not hold himself out by writing texts and so on as someone with expertise in that. But the flip side of that is, do you give an opinion in mechanics liens or do you go to Dave Bresco? Now, mechanics lien is something I think where you can't, in the ordinary case, go run, I think David would agree, go running off and ask a specialist. It's something that the generalist has to deal with on at least the primary level throughout his practice. But if it is in an area of expertise, you have to ask yourself, am I going to be caught in this catch-22 that I take it on, I then get sued and say, gee, it was a very difficult area of the law. Well, if it's in an area of specialization, the threshold question may have been, should I have gone to a specialist to begin with? Fuzzier and fuzzier, the question of retaining counsel. In England, it's perfectly clear that if a solicitor puts the facts before counsel and obtains counsel's advice, that generally speaking, he's not going to be liable. That's a little more difficult question in Ontario. I guess it breaks down into a number of practical questions. If something has a litigious overtone, and then I think that you're probably wise uh, to consult either in-house or outside your firm, someone with some litigious background. And the reason for that is as follows. Everyone who's involved in a counsel practice has seen literally hundreds of impeccable opinions, beautifully written, wonderful arguments of law. But the litigator, which is actually a fairly simple business, which we're both grateful for, the litigator says, this, ask this simple question. If A was a bad guy and did something naughty to B, how am I going to persuade a judge that A is going to win? And that's really the basic underlying question in any litigation opinion. The more, even more difficult than this is this question of business advice. My former partner at Goodman and Goodman, Arnie Cater, who's now gone into the, cross the line and gone into the world of business advice, which many of his partners would say he'd crossed years before he stopped practicing, uh, tells this story against himself on a uh, trip in California for a company of John Bassett's called Glen Warren. Arnie was in, in California with the president of Glen Warren, and the president was on the phone to uh, Bassett back in Ontario. Bassett talks so loudly that he doesn't need a phone to get from Ontario to California, but Arnie was not pleased with what was going on in the area of business advice, so he took over the phone and, and delivered a brief 10-minute tirade to John Bassett on what the business decision should be. And Bassett said to him, Peter, any time I want your business advice, I'll let you know. And it's a good, it's a good little anecdote for, for lawyers because I think particularly in the commercial field, you are apt to cross over into the business area. The difficulty is, what about the clients who are not John Bassett? What about the guy who runs the steel business, something of that nature, who follows this growing trend in North America to ask his lawyer for advice at every turn? I think the simple answer there is that if you're forced into giving business advice, but you have to qualify it. You have to say, Joe, you're the man with a steel business. I'm not. I'm just a lawyer. You've asked me for advi my advice, so I think I'd say I'll sell those 100 tons of steel. But I think that you have to qualify it. The final area is the question of the use of terminology. And I think uh, Don Pierce may be dealing with this because I asked him what the practice was. And that's the use of terms such as certify. I certify your title. Now, I think that a layman, when he sees the expression certify, would say, the lawyer has guaranteed that I have good title to this house. Now, obviously, you can't do an opinion on a real estate transaction saying, maybe you've got good title, maybe you don't. Here's my bill. But <laughs> the question is whether in law, when you certify the title, you are held to a standard over and above negligence. I've only been able to find one case, which is an old Exchequer Court uh, case, which didn't deal with it precisely, but which treated the case as though there was, it was, the standard was negligence. 
I think that Don would say that the general view and the practice is that when you say I certify, you're still only held to standard of negligence. I think the simple answer is don't use terms like I certify. Don't use flat statements of fact that someone could interpret as a warranty. Now, just in conclusion, there are two questions which are particularly difficult. The first question is, what is your standard of diligence on a point of law? We have all these wonderful general statements about, your, about the standard of care of a lawyer, but there are very few cases which say this is what you have to do when you give a legal opinion. I think it's quite clear that you have to know certain general statutes. It's clear from the cases. Obviously, you've got to know limitation periods. That can be a little tricky. A few years ago, there was a situation where if the CBC broadcast a libel against your client, you had to sue the CBC within three months. But under the Crown Liability Act, you had to give them 90 days notice before you started the action. So you had three days to get rolling. That's not exactly one of your standard limitation problems, but there are other limitations lurking in wait for us in various arcane statutes. But the next question then is, you tell you, someone comes to you, he's an engineer working on a building project, and this is an actual case in which both David and I gave an opinion, that he comes to you and he says, look, I'm worried about the contractor, I think you better sue him. And you give him the advice that yes, your only recourse is to sue him, uh, you're an engineer working on this project, you are not entitled to a mechanic's lien. Well, all you have to do is flip open uh, Bristol and Mechanics Liens at page 158, and there it is in black and white. It says that an engineer is in, working on a project like that is entitled to a mechanic's lien. I think quite clear that if it's that flip open in the book and read the black letter law, that you're negligent if you miss that. To take the other extreme, which I've used in the paper, if you give an opinion on the point of law, which eventually goes to the Supreme Court of Canada, and there's a 5-4 decision against you, it's inconceivable that you would be held to be negligent for giving an opinion which was held by four judges in the Supreme Court of Canada. The problem is, what's in between? What do you have to do in between? And I, as far as I'm concerned, there are no clear-cut answers. The only thing I think you can do to protect yourself is that in this area, good form is good practice. So that when you do your opinion, you state right up at the front, you have asked me to consider this, my opinion is that, my recommendation is this, my opinion is based on one, two, three, or it's based on the material you've provided to me, and any other qualifications, and then your detailed reasons. It makes sense. I know a lot of lawyers who give eight-page opinions, and it's only in the final line that they tell the client what to do. I once was... Uh, bumped into a client of mine who, I must say in my own defense, was not very eight bray and uh, I bumped into him in an elevator and he said, oh, I, I got your letter, David, thank you very much. And he said, uh, I've just retained the lawyer to explain it to me. <laughs> uh, probably the most cutting comment that a lawyer can receive. But what you're doing when you set out this good form, you're telling them right up front. There are a lot of clients who only want to read the first sentence that it's, it's probably good from their point of view. But you're also setting out clearly in that opinion letter, this is what I've been retained to do, this is what my opinion is, this is what I base it on, and this is how I qualify it. And I think if you follow that, that's probably about the best guidance that we can give you. If you don't follow it, here's David to tell you about insurance.